all those that didn't come back, we're going to blame Arthur. So that's all. So, uh, so we're blaming you, Arthur, but we're glad to have you back this afternoon, and God bless you. Uh, just looking forward to have Peter teach this afternoon, and then in the morning, uh, we're going to have uh, Connie going to be bringing the word to us tomorrow morning. It's going to be awesome, but so glad to have you here. I'm sure some more are making their way back. Uh, you know, Peter, you got to preach really good this afternoon to keep us awake, so, uh, but uh, we're going to get out of here probably, I don't know, however how long the Lord leads Peter to, to minister, but I know it's going to be great. So, hey, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and, and we're going to turn it over to Peter and, and allow him to minister to us today. Father, we're so grateful for this time together. We, we're just thankful for the word of grace. Thank you so much for this message this morning from Arthur, and it just blessed our lives to live in the fullness of Jesus Christ, hallelujah. What grace is provided, Lord, we just receive that today. And uh, we call Peter blessed, his ministry blessed, his, his wife and family. God, all of them blessed today and uh, prospering. And Lord, we're, we're so grateful to have this man of God here with us today, bringing the word. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give it up for Peter. Come on, brother. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, if you get used to my accent. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit different than Arthur. Arthur grew up uh, in a different area than me in South Africa. Where I come from is um, more, I, w I don't know how to put it. Redneck. Yeah, more redneck. <laughs> um, something like that. Um, I just want to get more brightness here. Sorry about that, guys. So I, where I grew up, it is um, it's, it's in the Makwa land, as they call it. You try to say it. Say in the Makwa land. <laughs> and uh, we, we speak a slang Afrikaans with a lot of cuss words in it. And that is the honest truth. It's the honest truth. This is how I grew up as a child. And um, uh, the first day that I went to school, they, they sent me back home because I was cussing too much. <laughs> and uh, my mother is, I don't know where this kid learned this. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I caught it from her. And she was a, was a wonderful lady. <laughs> I, I, loved, I loved that a lot. And um, so this, this is, I grew up there till the, uh, uh, up to the age of 10. My dad worked in the copper mines. And uh, then from the age of 10 till I graduated in grade 12, I was in, in a place called Citrus Dal. Uh, they call it the Golden Valley. Basically, everything grows there. It's the rich farmers in that area. Good time of my life. And then I went to correctional services, and I was a warden there for seven years. And in that period of time, I came to Jesus. A prisoner told me about Jesus. And um, I, I just want to make a long story short. And not long after that, I went to Bible school and uh, start to study the theology thing. But God was good to me. Um, uh, I want to say to you, it's one of the greatest privileges as a child of God that you can, that when you come today to the place that you can receive the grace and the love that is in Jesus Christ. Amen. I think the hardest thing is to struggle in life under religion. Yes. Um, trying to please God in your own ability, trying to live up to a standard that is impossible. Um, I was there um, putting my finger out against the congregation, but my, in the meantime, I fail myself. In the meantime, I myself feel empty. And um, Arthur was teaching such a good sermon this morning uh, that we live from out of the fullness that is in us. Um, man, it, it, this is one of the biggest revelations that you can ever have to come to that conclusion, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Jesus say, in the last day of the feast, he stood up and he said, if everyone believes in me, <laughs> Streams of living water will come from his belly. And he was speaking about the Holy Spirit. Come on. There's a, there's a fountain in you already. And it's ready to burst loose. And um, me and Kathy, my beautiful wife here, we are on a journey that we are very excited about. And uh, we learn a lot from one another. And we have, th the last four or five months, we are into this new thing called meditation. And... Um, I mean, we always meditate, but we just do it different now. We, 
we sit and we hum and ha for two hours. <laughs> I'm joking. But <coughs> anyway, we, we really wait on the Lord to hear his voice and uh, to be directed by him. And uh, it is just amazing the things that come out, um, what the Lord show us and how it's sometimes being confirmed. Amen. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk this afternoon about what I call teaching with authority. And uh, I, I will work you up to that um, here. Um, Jesus say, Jesus made a statement when he began to teach. He said, the Spirit of the Lord, in Luke 4, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken hearts, to set the captive free, to preach recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of Jubilee. A broken heart is someone who has a broken belief system. Which means, because of your heart you believe. How many of you agree with me? Yeah. Romans 10, 10, with the heart you believe. So if you have a broken heart, then it means you have a broken belief system. And uh, God is in the process of restoring that. He's after your heart. Um, I preached a while ago. I preached somewhere in the United States. I won't tell you where. Um, and uh, uh, I made a statement in my sermon just to show you how, how people think and how things work according to religion. I, I, I quote uh, 1 John 4, 17, where Jesus say, um, uh, 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 where the scriptures say, as he is, so we are in this world. And I say, Jesus said to me, I am you and you are me. Same meaning. So someone in the congregation went to the pastor <laughs> and say, Peter say, he's Christ. And um, he wants the pastor to rebuke me. And uh, actually, he wants the pastor to rebuke me publicly. Reprimand me publicly because I said that. And I said, I never said that. I have never said that I am the Christ, the Savior of the world. Are you with me? I said, the statement that I make is, he said, I am, he, I am you and you are me, Peter, based on 1 John 4, 17. As he is, so, so we are in this world. I never made that statement. But you know what? He heard me through his heart's beliefs. He heard me through his heart's beliefs. So that's why many people, well, I've planted lots of churches in my life. So I, I would come in a place and I would plant a church. And there's people come, yes, grace, yes, the love of God. Yes, it's amazing. And then three months down the road, you see their countenance change. And then slowly but surely, they disappear. And then you will one day, oh, brother, what happened to you? Or sister, what happened to you? Now, you said something that is not right, you know, because people have beliefs in their hearts that they treasure. And some of those beliefs is even not even right. <laughs> uh, uh, Jesus said that, that the evil man, uh, uh, excuse me, Jesus said that the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart. So, in other words, he put value to what he believed. Whether it's evil or it's good, he put value to what he believed. And that word evil there, we're going to look at that a little bit later, is poneros in the Greek, which means to toil, to work, to, to, be, an annoy, to be annoyed and frustrated. That's what that word really means, poneros in the Greek. Check it out for yourself. In Strong's, it's easy to find it. So, Jesus said there's people who put value to their works. Their hearts is programmed to work. Isn't it interesting? So I want to I wanna go in here today and say to you that, that I honestly believe that, there's some, that the body of Christ still struggle with certain things. And one of the things that the body of Christ struggle with is um, if I really preach grace to its fullest, uh, the pure grace. I'm gonna. I have to be careful that people don't get loose and and sin. And um, that's why you would see the people preach grace. That, I'm, I'm a grace preacher. Uh, I have a grace church. This is our doctrine. We go for that. This is what we believe. But you would hear them, and you see there's still boundaries. You would still hear there is still laws. There is still things that they mix in because they are afraid that people can begin to live a lifestyle they're not supposed to. Can I tell you something? I trust grace. Because if I preach grace in its purest form, I can stand back and watch how God's grace changed people's lives. Are you with me? 
I like to say that word woof. <laughs> but I don't say it right, the right way. I say woof, W-I-F-F, two Fs, man. <laughs> woof, are you woofing? <coughs> Someone made me a T-shirt like that one day. But <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> so um, we are afraid to, to, to preach grace in its purest form. But you know what Jesus, John say in First John, John say, uh, um, uh, the law was given by Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus. It's two opposites. You can't mix the two. Grace is a reality that we have to preach the way that it is. So I asked Jesus a question one day. <laughs> Not long ago, I asked him this question. I said, Jesus, what did you preach? Because how many of you agree with me that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God? Faith comes by hearing. So the things that Jesus have taught must have stirred faith in people that they had so many healings. Now, he is the Son of God. He have an anointing on him. How many of you sit here today are sons and daughters of God? We have an anointing too. <laughs> we have an anointing. Uh, uh, people, people sometimes come to me and they prophesy over me and say, Brother, you got the mantle of Elijah. No, I don't want his mantle. He's dead. I got the anointing of Jesus. He's risen from the dead. Are you with me? So, so, so uh, 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 we, I say to me, I know that you are anointed. You anoint us too. Even I look at your disciples. You send them out. You know what's interesting? Jesus said to his disciples, go, say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. For freely you receive, freely give. They had a stupid, simple, simple message. Just tell the people the kingdom is here. They understood that. In their context, they understand what it means when someone says the kingdom of heaven is here. They are actually saying, heaven has shown up in this place. Anything can happen now. That's what they really said. So I asked Jesus, that's good enough that you say that to them. Say, go say to the people. And I can say to you today, the kingdom of heaven is here. I don't know if it's really going to make a big impact. The, the kingdom of heaven is here. You show up with it here. Inside of you. But I ask him, what did you teach? What did you? There's not really much sermons that you preach and teach. The only scriptures that we have is, is that, 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 that you say stuff like the, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Well, that's a big sermon. <laughs> it's just like that. Are you with me? Or the, 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 the gospel of peace, you know, is being preached. And, and, and I was asking him, so I was reading through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I read the famous sermon of Jesus, the Beatitudes. And I was working through Matthew 5. And when I come to the end of chapter 5, I said to him, it's the most horrible sermon that someone ever preached. <laughs> it's a fact. It's a horrible sermon. Think of it now. Let me give you some statements. Can I do that? That, 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 that he have made Jesus, our Savior. He made some statements. And I, I want to read you some of that. Can I do that? <laughs> and, 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 and the best of all is he start off with stuff like this. Um, he start off with statements like this. You have heard <laughs> it was said. To, the, to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say. <laughs> and then he come and he say that whoever is angry with his brother. You know how many times I was angry with, with, with Arthur? <laughs> huh? Or some other pastors that say stupid things. And I say, I'm angry with that guy. He's working right up against my sermon. <laughs> Jesus, take him out. <clears throat> I'm joking. I don't do that. But uh, so, he, and, and he says, but whoever is angry with you shall be in cause, uh, who, without a cause, shall be in danger of judgment. And whatever, and whoever say to a brother, Raka, I hope I pronounce it right, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever say you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. I said, Jesus, what is good news about that? 
And, and he made more statements here. Like, you have, you have heard that it was said, those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. He makes statements like that in his sermon. It's a horrible sermon. And then he goes on here in, in, in uh, verse 29 and 30. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. <laughs> Cast it from you. For if it is more profitable for you <laughs> that one of your members perish than for you, your whole body to be cast into hell. It's a horrible sermon. I'm, I'm, you can go and read through that. Okay? You know what Jesus really did here? He put steroids on the law. Jesus said, they say, but I say. He said, you guys think that you can obey the law. That's good with me. You can live blameless. Like Paul says, I'm blameless. I'm a Pharisee. <laughs> I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. So you, you can do it. But I am, what, you know what I'm doing here? I am putting the law way out there. That you cannot turn around and say, I have obeyed the law. I make it very difficult for you. So Jesus is preaching, and then he comes to the end of chapter 5, and he says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I mean, if I would sit in that audience, I would say, Boys, pack your stuff, we're leaving. I'm done with this guy. I'm not listening anymore. But Jesus was bringing over a point. So when he was completely done teaching, listen to what the people say. Have you, have you read what the people say? The scriptures say, in verse 27, and they were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority. Whoa! And not as the scribes. And when I read that, I got the answer. And I said, Lord, suddenly my eyes open what you teach. Because you teach with authority, not as the scribes taught. What did the scribes taught? They lay the law on the people. He put, they put condemnation and guilt and a sin conscience on the people. They make it for the people impossible. Jesus came and take it off. To teach with authority is to remove the condemnation and the guilt and the sin conscience from people so that they can begin to receive. Are you guys still with me here? Say with me. Verse, verse, verse 28 say, uh, verse 27 say, and they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. Wow. See, uh, many people say, oh, he teaches with authority. Then it's a guy who jump around and scream and the sweat is running off him. And then, uh, and then I listen to his sermon on the end of the day. I ask myself, I wonder what the guy really said. Because I'm leaving with condemnation, man. I'm leaving with guilt. I'm feeling so bad. And that guy, and then they say, oh, man, he can preach. He put the words in. He can pack it in, man. No, he did not teach with authority. A person who teaches with authority don't even have to scream, don't even have to shout, don't even have to jump around. It's a person who has the ability to remove every obstacle from you so that you can receive from God. That's a person who teaches with authority. And that's what Jesus did. Now listen, Jesus gave the answer in that passage in verse 6 and 7. You are in chapter 6 and 7. You will see in chapter 6 and 7. Suddenly he will go, go into prayer and as I come down to, uh, excuse me, as I come down to uh, uh, verse 7 to 12, and when I was reading through this, what Jesus had done in his teaching, he brought a division or he showed the difference between two covenants. That's what he really did. He shows them that you are under this covenant and you thought that you can lift up the standard to please God in your own ability and that you can qualify for the blessing. But I'm going to show you that it's actually impossible. So we draw a line between the two covenants. And he begins to go into another covenant. Into begin slowly but surely. He couldn't give it all to them. Because he was not risen from the dead yet. But he began to take them slowly into the new covenant. Amen. Um, I was thinking this morning when Arthur was teaching. I was thinking... At the stage of my life that I was feeling empty. How many of you were there that you, that you feel empty, huh? 
Oh, it's only one or two people here. But and, and I feel I, I, I felt empty, so, so I, 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 I was a young Christian, so I said, I'm going to fast and pray for five days until I met God, until God had filled me up, man. I'm going to share with God. But the biggest mistake that I made is I let the family know. And they are not saved. <laughs> so now they watch me. And uh, day two, now I'm not even, <laughs> I mean, I'm not even praying for God to fill me. I'm praying now God help me to make it to the end of day five <laughs> because I'm hungry. Man, I'm hungry, and I see chickens fly, roasted chickens fly. I'm, I'm, I'm hungry now. I'm, 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 now I'm really empty. Now, now I'm really empty, and, I'm, and, and the family is watching me like hawks, man. They're watching me. <laughs> check him that he don't steal something in the fridge in the night. Just check him that he don't take some. Just watch this guy, you know. I mean, the fifth day, <laughs> I felt so far away from God. <laughs> The fifth day, I went to Bumbo's. We didn't have McDonald's those days yet, but we had Bumbo's. You remember Bumbo's? It's a hamburger joint. And I was sitting outside in my car waiting for the sun to go down. <laughs> so the moment that that sun is down, I walk in there, man. I bought the biggest hamburger I got. Uh, I will never forget a double, a double thick strawberry milkshake. And that burger, I suck on that straw that my head bent in. <laughs> and as I was drinking that, 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 and I was eating that hamburger, the onion pieces were sitting all over my face. I was going into this. The guy behind the counter standing like this, <laughs> looking at me. And I was just, up, and, and for suddenly I feel full. Jesus, I feel good now. <laughs> But I come out of that so disappointed, so disillusioned, because I've done something that I would thought I'm going to reach God, and God is going to form. Now, I'm not against fasting. I never ever fast after that again. <laughs> but I, I, am not, I am not against fasting. You, you understand what I'm saying to you? I think, I believe there's a place for fasting. Like, for instance, if you... I don't even know if there's, if, there, if there's a reason for it, but I love to eat, man. I love to eat. I love to eat. I, I'm sorry. I, I can fast for one meal, but, um, but, but the point that I want to make here is that I, I've done something again that I believe I can reach God, but I did not. You, you, you understand what I mean? That I would get God to do something for me. You know what was the problem? I didn't really know who I was. I didn't really know who I am in Christ Jesus. So here comes Jesus and Matthew 7, and he began to bring them slowly but surely into this. And, he, and, and, and I believe he was talking about prayer, but I, I think if you understand his culture and if you understand in the setup that he was talking, I believe that even the people in his day understand the symbolism that he was using. And I also believe that... Um, I also, I, I, I'm actually disappointed that Matthew and Luke didn't expand more on this teaching. Because I believe he said more. You know, they just wrote certain things on paper. I believe he said much more. But here is Jesus, and he switched over from, from, from doing, he switched over to this. Ask, and it will be given to you. He switched from doing to receiving. And he says, seek and you will find. He's, it's not saying, okay, if you seek hard enough, you will maybe find. He says, no, no, if you seek, you will find. He says, ask and you will. It's a promise. It will be given to you. He says, knock and it will be opened for you. Because I believe that at this point, after they hear all these things, they probably say to themselves, how in the world can you be even a child of God after he said all those things? So now he bring them into reality and he says, here's the answer. Everything sweets now. Everything changes now. I'm bringing a change in the covenant. I am the grace that you always wanted to have. I'm the grace that you needed. And I'm busy. And I'm going to bring you as my disciples slowly but surely into this. And listen to what he say here. For everyone asks who asks receives. It's a promise. Say receive. Come on. Man, come on. 
Because they probably say, Lord, how can we live this life? And he says, just ask and you will receive the power to do it. <laughs> just seek and you will receive the power to do it. Knock and God will open up to you and he will help you. There was nothing, you know, he, he, was, he was bringing them into reality. And then he say, or what man, say man, is there among you that if he asks for bread, he will give him a stone. Listen to the contrast. Look to what he is saying. How many of you agree with me that the law was written on stone? How many of you will agree with me that Jesus is the bread of life? Hallelujah. He said, ask bread. Ask me that would satisfy you. I am the bread of life. How many of you remember Jesus said, I'm the bread of life that will satisfy. Ask and I will satisfy you. If you ask me for something to satisfy the emptiness in you, guess what? I will not give you another law again. I will satisfy you like the bread of life satisfies you. Huh? And here goes Jesus. Go on. He's not done. And he say, and he say or, uh, or if he asks for a fish, I will not give him a serpent. How many of you know that the serpent is full of poison? How many of you know that the serpent agree in the garden and he deceived them into works? And into the law, because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does a fish represent? Now listen to this. What did Adam say when he ate from that tree? He says, I fear and I am naked. Fish always represent in the new covenant of abundance, overflow, and provision. Go and check it. Always. Jesus used the contrast. He says, I will not deceive you. <sighs> if you ask me for something to satisfy you. And fill you. I will not deceive you. I will not poison you. Because he even called the scribes. You vipers. You brood of vipers. Remember? He called them. You brood of vipers. Don't you think it's awesome? Listen to this. We go on here. Because this is amazing. He's, this is what he's saying now. If you then being evil. Go and check this word again. Poneros. Say poneros. It means toiling, hardships, annoyances, and frustrations. He says, you who are into works, trying to please God, to bless you, who cannot live up to the standard, wants to give good gifts to your children. How many of you know that? Even when we were religious, we give good gifts to our children because we love our children. How much more? Your heavenly Father, come on. Say much more. Thank you, Jesus, for a new covenant where we receive everything. Much more because our Father don't toil. Our Father is in rest and He has everything. But listen to what He say. Ask for good gifts. How many of you agree with me that grace is a gift? <laughs> Healing is a gift. Provision is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Everything in the new covenant is gift. So Jesus said, I'm switching over from you doing to get to you receiving for free what the Father has for you. I'm switching you over to that. We are bringing a dividing line between the two covenants. And that's why the people say on the earth, what teaching, new teaching is this? With authority. Because authority in teaching like the condemnation and the guilt and the unworthiness and the feelings of unworthiness and the fear off from you. And then you can receive. So Jesus said to me, so this is what I did, Peter. I take all the sin conscience off from them and then I heal them. And then I deliver them and I set them free. There's nothing difficult about it. Because I already did it. You know, it's amazing, even before the resurrection, they broke through a roof. I love to use this illustration. A young man brought a man, and they, a crippled man, and they drop him down the ceiling. You remember the story? Listen to what Jesus said to this guy. He's crippled. Son, your sins are forgiven you. <laughs> he, listen to what he do. This guy is a slave. In the, according to the law, he's a slave to his sickness. According to the law, he failed the law somewhere, or his parents. That's what the law say. Jesus moved him from a slave to a son. He said to him, son, whew, 
He lifted him out of slavery first. Then he said to him, your sins are forgiven you. Do you know what it means to be forgiven? It means to be divorced from the problem. <laughs> he divorced that guy. And then he knew that they were reasoning in their hearts. How can he say, that's blasphemy that he can say that. And he said that you might know that the Son of Man have the power to forgive sins on earth. I say to this man, stand up and walk. See, that's authority. He didn't even do a weird thing. <laughs> Are you with me? He didn't even in this context say, okay, all right, dude, stand there. I spit from here and we'll hit you. You will be okay. I'm going to do a, a, a charismatic move on you. No, he didn't. He just teached with authority. Amen? You still with me? <laughs> Oh, man, thank you, Jesus. Some of you are never going to come back to church. <laughs> I'm joking, you will. Because after today, you will realize your pastor is all the time teaching with authority. Isn't that awesome? Um, listen to what the scriptures say here. Um, I'm going to skip that. <laughs> I'm going to run into a rabbit trail here, and I have to explain I have to skip that. Forgive me for that. But we will go into some good stuff here. Um, we teach with authority when we teach grace in its purest form. This is when we begin to teach that it's with authority. You don't have to scream and shout. Uh, there's a place for that. I mean, if that's your personality and you do it that way, hallelujah. I do it sometimes. I'm loud sometimes. I shout sometimes. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that to teach with authority really means to take off all the obstacles that is there. Uh, what did you call it, Arthur? The things that block your well? The board up your well to take those boards off. Amen? So um, listen to what the scriptures say about Jesus in Acts 13 verse 38 to 39 listen to what the scriptures say about Jesus it says therefore let it be known to you brethren that through this man that is Jesus is preached to you the forgiveness of sins and by him everyone who believes say believe is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Isn't that amazing? He preached forgiveness and justification because you could not be justified by the law of Moses. All 613 of them, <laughs> not the 10, all 613 under the old covenant. And Jesus teached forgiveness of sins. Say forgiveness. He divorced them from the situation. So when we communicate what God say about us, or about our sins, we discover what he believes concerning our redeemed oneness and innocence. We are cleansed from every distortion we believe about ourselves. Isn't that awesome? It's the things that we believe about ourselves that is a distortion in our lives. You have been created in blamelessness. You have been made blameless by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. So it is finished. Let's, I, I want to go into with, with talking about it is finished. And, and I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit that if there's anything here today that, that is holding you back, that that is going to fall down. Amen. Amen. You know, in, in, in John 19 verse 30 um, when Jesus died on the cross, the scripture says, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, gave up his spirit. The word here for finish, we all heard about the finished work of the cross, but the word for finish here is tetelestai. Jesus say, tetelestai. Amen. It's rooted in the word teleo. We have a Bible school called teleo. And the word teleo means end, finish, final, conclusion. It has come to an end. So when Jesus say it is finished, 
What is powerful about tetelestai, because tetelestai is rooted from teleo. Don't worry about it. I'm giving you some Greek stuff here and things. But, but what is amazing about this word tetelestai in the Greek form, it means that it is a perfect pe- present tense. That denotes that the action which is completed in the past, but it affects, is up till today, this moment. That's what Jesus did. Say, it is finished. So when he finished it, it's a, it's a present perfect tense. That means this is something that have happened in the past, but the effects is going continuously going on into the future until you leave this earth. It's working for you. And the people after you, it's going on. It is finished once for all. When he say tetelestai, they probably thought, the Greek people probably thought, he's crazy. He is saying about, he say, it is something finished that is going to continue on. That's what he really said. And the Romans and the Greeks that were standing there understood it. <laughs> Powerful stuff. It is finished. Listen to what the Bible say in Hebrews 10 verse 14. I just want to show you this word. He says, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Did you know that that word perfect? It's teleo in the Greek. It's the root word of tetelestai. Jesus have, by one offering, end everything in your life. He brought it to a final conclusion. Everything in your life that holds you back, that robs you of peace. He brought an end to it. Isn't that powerful? By one offering. Many people focus on the finished work of the cross and, and they think that it's just something that have happened on that cross. But can I tell you something? You will begin to experience the fullness and the goodness of God the moment that you realize it is finished in you. Say in me. Ooh. It is finished in you. Not only on that cross, it is finished in you. What did God finish in you? That's the question that we have to ask ourselves. What did he brought to an end when Jesus died on that cross and everyone who believes in him received that finished work? You agree with me? What did he finish in me? He finished the corrupted man that ate from that tree that become a DIY man, a do-it-yourself man. Say, do it yourself. That's what happened to him. See, Jesus found me in Home Depot among the tools. And, he, and I was looking for a tool to help myself. And Jesus removed my tool belt and my boots, my work boots and my helmet and my gloves and everything. He says, uh, son, come with me. And he guided me into the garden center. And he introduced me to the tree of life. Huh? Well, how many times we walk past by Home Depot again, we forgot about the tree and then say, maybe there's a tool somewhere. I can help myself. Uh, that we can do here to, to, to fix this thing. Are you, are you with me? <laughs> huh? Jesus set me free from the DIY man. That man died. Listen to what Paul say. Paul say, I never understood it when he was talking about, how many times did you quote this verse in uh, Galatians 2? I'm crucified with Christ. It's not I that live anymore. But the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me because he loved me. I didn't have a clue what I was talking about when I quote that verse. I was trying to convince myself that I'm crucified. How many of you were there? So I confess it. (laughs) I confess, I'm crucified. Man, this thing is not going to tempt me anymore. (laughs) Five hours later, I'm in that thing. How did I end up here? Are you with me? Horrible. But there's something that Paul say in that passage that sums it all up. He say, for I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, Christ died in vain. What die? The law man, the DIY man die. That's why Paul said, I'm crucified, man. I'm not going back to that lifestyle that I try to be righteous. That man is dead. He's gone and over. He's not living anymore. You want to get me back that I try to be righteous in my own ability? You've made a mistake. That guy's dead. I'm not going back there. 
I am as righteous as Jesus is right now. I can't add to that. It's not Jesus plus something. I can't add to that. Are you still with me here this morning? <laughs> I am telling you, man, um, you would ask yourself, how is it possible that sometimes I, 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 am, I am failing? How many of you, see, I preached last Sunday in Healing Grace Church, and I, said, and I said to the people, there's a huge difference between practicing the works of the flesh or the things of the flesh and to stumble. It's a huge difference. People stumble. Christians stumble. Oh, it's only me that is not holy here. <laughs> Christians stumble. It's, there's a difference in practicing something. If I practice something, then it means I want to reach a goal with it. I'm working hard to reach a goal. So people who are in all that kind of works of the flesh that you mentioned in Galatians 5, he says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because they are empty inside and they are doing things all the time over and over and they can't get rid of this emptiness in them. He says, therefore, they can't receive the kingdom. But if they come to the understanding that those things have been initiated by the teachings of the law, by mixture with grace, it creates an emptiness in you because the law begins to point on the flesh and tell you you fall short. So now you have to do something to get it in. But he says, turn to grace. That you can see Jesus has already done it for you. And that you are blameless in his sight. And that you already got it all in him. Amen. Amen. So Paul is talking about this. There's a huge difference between us. I can't go into that whole teaching now. <clears throat> so what the law does, when we begin to mix the laws... What, what is the law? People say, well, I'm not under the Ten Commandments. Anything that you do to get God to love you, anything that you do to get God to be blessed uh, so that God can bless you, anything that you do in your ability to get the favor of God or the favor of man, you're under the law. You still with me? And what it does is it di di redirects you from the finished work of Jesus Christ. So what, how can God love a person who sometimes um, have wrong behavior. How many times do you guys have wrong behavior? I have wrong behavior sometimes, you know. Um, how many of you realize when, that in life, sometimes there can be pressure with, say, for instance, business or ministry or what it is, and you're not resting in Jesus all the time, and this thing's bombarding you all the time, and the next moment, you have wrong behavior. <laughs> you behave as, as someone you are not. <laughs> you, you fall out of who you really are in Christ Jesus. And, and you are like, okay, all right, just wait there, Jesus. I'm going to do this thing now here for a while. I will come back. Just hold on. <laughs> you know? It doesn't work that way. Um, but, but, but we have sometimes wrong behavior. And the point is, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, if you study about love, it, it, uh, how many of you agree with me that God is love? So 1 Corinthians is all about who God is. And 1 Corinthians 13 is all about God. God, God is patient. <laughs> you know, uh, but you make one st uh, patient there, there. He says, love keeps no record of wrongs. So in other words, God keeps no record of wrongs. He cannot. It's impossible. So Christians fail. And then they think, okay, right, I need to fix this in my own ability. It's like, it's like I wrote this book, okay? It's a very simple book on how to receive the grace of God. It's very simple. It helps people that, that just come into grace. But there's one statement in this book that's wrong. And you know where it comes from? Same thing with people who see things through their heart. When I, when, when I had to proofread this book, I missed one point. I missed one statement in this book. I missed it. And I didn't see it. And after the book was printed, I saw it. Oh, my gosh. How did that happen? And I went back to my original script and I said, I didn't write that, what they put in here. But the people who edited the book was religious. So my statement was, if you make a mistake or if you fail, confess your righteousness and go on with your life. They say that if you make a mistake or fail, they put in there, confess your sin and go on with your life. I never said sin. Are, are you with me? So now I have to rewrite this whole book. So, but I warned the people. <laughs> about it. I tell them, I tell them beforehand. But can you see they, they, their hard beliefs 
couldn't accept that. So, the, oh, he, the writer made the mistake. And I missed that one point. <laughs> Can you believe this when I proofread it? And it just shows you, but love keeps no record of wrongs. God don't keep record of wrongs. He can't. It's impossible. Because, can I tell you why? Because the cross was a success. The cross was an absolute success. The resurrection was an absolute success. God can't see you as a sinner anymore. He don't accept you as a sinner anymore. He see you as blameless, innocent, and righteous as Jesus is right now. It doesn't matter how you feel, what you've done yesterday. I don't. Are you with me? So we are taking off these things. Because many Christians today feel bad about themselves. I was like that. I'm such a horrible person. I did it again. Why did I do it again? Huh? This is raw grace I'm preaching here. See, in Ephesians, in Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13, he talk about God gave apostles, prophets, and all. You know that passage so well. But there's one statement that he made here. And he say there, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Did you know that that word in the Greek is teleo again? <laughs> to a man who is established in the finished work of Jesus. Who have come to the final conclusion of what Jesus has done. Ha! Wow. Isn't that awesome? That this is our ministry that we have to bring you to that place that you have made a final conclusion. Reckon yourself dead indeed then to sin. That word reckon is logitomai. It means to make a calculation until you come to a conclusion. That you have, that you have made a conclusion in your mind. That man is dead. He don't live anymore. That guy who tries so hard to get God's approval. That guy who works so hard to get mankind's approval. He's dead. And if people even remind me of him, someone posted the other day on Facebook a very powerful thing. And they say, if you remind me of my old life, it is like you telling me to go back to my old house. I'm not living there anymore. Isn't that true? I'm not living there. It's not me. I'm not living there. I live in a new house now. <laughs> I'm in a new place, dude. So here we go. And, and I'm closing down. I promise I close down. Um, to, be, to be finished means not to see yourself through the old covenant anymore. Um, it's that you stop seeing yourself through the veil. Because the veil, a veil, if you have a veil on your face, you can see. But it's a distorted image. You have a distorted image of everything around you. To live in the finished work is that the veil is removed and you see yourself completely in Jesus. You see mirror. Uh, uh, um, we have a mirror in our house that I like because I look good in that mirror. <laughs> For some reason. If I look in this mirror, I like this mirror. It makes me... It makes me look it better. <laughs> but then I went last night in the hotel. I hate those mirrors in that hotel. It's like, oh, I'm old. I look tired. God, this is not good. Who created these mirrors? Are you with me? I will stay in that house just for that one reason. That mirror make me look good, man. And this is the same if you look into Jesus, you look good. Because we look like Him. Are you with me? There is no flaws. There's no distorted image. I look like Him. And when I look at Him, it's a smile on His face. There's no judgment. You're looking good, Peter. Go on, son. Amen? So we have, we, 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 we have this... When there is something missing, if you, if you discover, there's something that, that I've discovered. I struggle at a while, I, I struggle with fear, with anxiousness a, a while ago. Um, me and, and I brought myself into it. I talked to Kathy about it. I said, I can't understand. I have this anxiousness continuously in my stomach. It's like a knot that sits here. What is this? And then and I was praying about it and just said, Lord, just help me with this. 
And it took me right back to Genesis. Um, when uh, just after Adam ate from that tree, and, he, and Adam says, I heard, your, I, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And the Lord said to me, a thought came into your mind that, you, that there is something lacking in your life. A thought came into your mind that there is something missing in your life. That's why you have this anxiousness. I want to show you something very powerful. Love has been perfected, the Greek word is tetelestai, <laughs> among us in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect Teleos, they say it here this time, a different tense of it. Perfect love cast out fear. For the first time I saw that a f the love that is based on the finished work of Jesus is what's got power. How many of you know that the greatest demonstration of love ever was God become a man and die on the cross for mankind? It's the biggest demonstration of love. There is no greater demonstration. God says, we got to save this situation. I want my people back. I'm going to take that position. I'm going to die, he's the word. You know what's interesting? He was naked on that cross. Come on. Adam lost his cover. The quality of God's life, the glory that he was living in. Jesus lost it for us. And they nail him to that cross and they hang there naked. He took, he took the emptiness, the, 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 the feelings that we have that something is missing, something is lost, the nakedness that Adam experienced, he took it. And he hang naked. I want to tell you something here this morning. Say in me. See, fear in this, in this context, if you read this context, that you will see, that, that the, the whole thing here is to overcome fear. It says there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Again, tetelestai or teleo. We love him because he first loved us. I don't have to get God to love me. He loved me long before I loved him. Yeah. Are, are you with me? Yeah. And he even took my nakedness. And he took my emptiness and what is missing in my life, he took it. And he died it away. And three days later, he rose one new man, glorious. Jesus prayed before he died. He said, Father, give me back my glory that I had with you before time began or before the foundation of the world. He said, give me that glory back. So Jesus came out and he got that glory back where he's seated on the right hand of the Father above all principalities and powers, anything that can come against us. And we are seated with him in that glory now. We are not naked. We don't miss a thing. There's nothing missing. There's nothing lacking in your life. You are not a sinner. You are not condemned. You are, don't have a sin conscience. You can create it for yourself, but it's a lie. Yeah. Jesus dealt with that long before. I want to read to you this passage, and I saw it for the first time in my life. Remember, I quote to you uh, uh, Galatians 2 verse 20. Remember, uh, I'm crucified with Christ. And then but Paul didn't stop there when he said, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness come through the law, Christ died in vain. If Paul didn't stop there. He's still writing. <laughs> and now he say, and I'm closing down with this passage because I saw something that I never saw before. He say, oh foolish Galatian, who has bewitched you or who has cast a spell on you that you should not obey the truth or believe? Before whose eyes, now listen to this, Jesus Christ was clearly uh, portrayed among you as crucified. Can I tell you, it's a wrong Greek translation. The word among here is not among, the word is in. I'm going to read it again in the re original Greek. Who is bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed in you as crucified. So I said, Jesus, what does that mean? He says, the day when you have accepted me and I move into the house 
everything that was not from me was crucified and dealt with and taken away out of you. And listen to what he say. He goes on here and he say, and I love this part as he go on. Listen to this. This only I want to learn from you. <laughs> it's a question. Did you receive? Can you see that word receive again? The spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith. What is the hearing of faith? God made you righteous apart from your works. The hearing of faith is Jesus died away, the sinner man, the man that was corrupt, the man that was empty, the man that God said, he died him away. That is the hearing of faith. He rose from the dead as one new man, and now we receive righteousness as a free gift. Hallelujah. So we say, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? Paul says, I am crucified that man away. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit, are you now may being made perfect in the flesh? You started off in the Spirit, now you want to be perfect in the flesh. You will never be perfect in the flesh. It's impossible. But the hearing of faith say, tells you that you have or, he already made you perfect. He already perfected you. As a believer, you are as righteous as Jesus is now. And Christ lives in you the hope of glory. You are as full wall to wall <laughs> right now of Jesus. You can't even imagine in your own mind. God will have to give you a revelation. Amen. And he says, have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed, if it was in vain. Therefore, he who supply the Spirit to you and works miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? Paul do the same thing that Jesus did. He preached and he teaches with authority. He took the righteousness by works and righteousness by the law. He took it away from the people. He basically showed them that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Jesus died on that tree. Curses everyone who hang on the tree. <laughs> he showed them that Jesus became naked so that we can be clothed with a cloak of righteousness, with garments of, uh, excuse me, with, with, with garments of salvation and a cloak of righteousness. You are not naked. You are not empty. Right now, you have the fullness of Christ in you. To teach with authority means that we remove you from the DIY man. <laughs> we remove you out of Home Depot stool section. We bring you into the garden center and introduce you to the tree of life. And you eat and feast from that. I'm telling you people, um, if you look into Jesus, you look just like him. The power of the gospel, when we begin to really preach the gospel, the true gospel, we begin to call those things which are not as though they are. So that means we begin to call you <laughs> what God say about you. We are not judging you. We are showing you who you are in Christ. I love Jesus the way that the people say it on the end there and say, he teach one with, as with, with authority, but not as the scribes. And I'm telling you that I honestly believe, and that's why I will never stop preaching grace. I honestly believe that this is the answer for mankind. Because it set people free from feelings of unworthiness. People begin to find themselves in Christ, and they begin to love for the first time. They begin to enjoy life. Without, imagine you can live a life that you never ever feel there's something missing in my life, there's something broken in my life. Imagine you can live a life every day that you wake up and say, man, God is amazing. I'm so full of God today. I am inseparable from His love today. I'm inseparable from heaven today. In fact, the kingdom of heaven has moved in with me. And I'm God's house. I'm not a sinner. I'm not guilty. I can maybe be guilty by doing something to my wife that I'm not supposed to do. But can I tell you what? If I'm full of the grace of God, I have the power not to live there. Amen. Do you agree with me on that? So Jesus taught with authority. 
And it was very easy to just tell them, your father loves you unconditionally. There's nothing that you can do to earn his love. He already has it. And he came and displayed the image of the father in this world. Father, we just thank you for every person that sits here this afternoon. We just thank you, Father, that your word speaks and that the gospel has the power unto salvation. We thank you, Lord, that every person here that is a believer has been made righteous, and I pray that they will grab onto that truth and that reality. Every believer here will sit with today or stand here with the, with the mindset, the mind of Christ, that there is nothing that can separate them from your love and that they can receive anything that they need to live a life in abundance here and now. And we praise you for that grace, Jesus. We thank you for that. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Give God some praise. Amen. <laughs> Woo. So um, I, I was just sitting there and I was just, um, man, I, I, this, is what, this, is what, this is what I thought. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. So you just made my baby jump, man. <laughs> so, I mean, you just, you just preaching down my corridor there, man. I, Listen, listen, church, I got to tell you something about these messages today. You've, you've got to allow, this is something you've got to allow to absorb into your spirit. You, you've got to allow that, that message of God's grace and freedom and what you have in Christ right now to, to absorb in your spirit. Because, because, you know, many of us was raised in that religious tradition, and that thing sometimes just wants to come jump right back on you. You know, and I just want, I want to convey to you, I, I would get this message. I'd get both of these, but I'd get this message again and, and just listen to these over and over again and, until you really get that in your spirit, what Jesus' finished work has done for you. It's awesome. It's awesome. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. Why don't, you, why don't you stand this afternoon and, man, I, I don't know about you, but I am full. I mean, I've been eating at the table, man, you know. I, I taught them that last Sunday about that table, right? I'm, I'm full. I've been eating there at the table today, and, and we've got Connie coming up tomorrow. It's going to be great. Uh, invite your in-laws and outlaws tomorrow. Get them all here, right? It's going to be such a great time. And I, I just thank you, Peter, for your word today, for your heart, man. So precious, Arthur, for your heart. I love you, man. Uh, you guys are just precious and, and so thankful for your words today. It's just I am so blessed. I am so blessed to be here today. You know, I, I'd rather be here in any jail. Amen. <laughs> Come on, somebody. It's awesome. Any hospital. God is good. Father, we are so, we're so extraordinarily blessed by this wonderful revelation of your love to us today and the grace of God. God, we're so blessed that we can live in such a time as this and experience your grace. Oh, Lord, just, just allow us, God, as we go throughout our day to show that grace to others, that, that they may experience, that they may have an aha moment of, of your love and your grace in their lives. God, thank you. We, are, we, we, had discovered, we were extraordinarily blessed to have such, such wonderful grace teachers with us this weekend, and we just thank you for their ministries, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for their homes. We thank you, God, for just moving in every family there, God, and into the lives of their homes, God, and, and minister to their children and their grandchildren. And God, may just great things happen in their lives. Amen. May, may great things begin to explode in, in these children and grandchildren's lives as well as these ministries. And, Lord, we are honored today. And, and we're just blessed, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Uh, why don't you turn around to, to five people today and say, you know, it doesn't help get any better than this. Come on, somebody. Come on. Tables, buy some product. Bless their ministries today. <laughs>